Hello, all you wonderful humans. Happy Sunday. Hope you're all doing well. This is going to be a shorter musing, at least that is the intent at the outset, uh, just because probably we're all churched out for the weekend, having sat through, gosh, how much? Nine hours? Last night was one hour instead of two hours. I never, I've lost track of like, we were doing Saturday night stuff. It was men only, and then it was men and women that they rotated, and then they stopped it, and now they're doing it again, but it's for everybody. So when they announced last night's, I'm like, wait, what? We're doing that again? But it was an hour. Anyways, so a lot of us are kind of churched out, but there is one um, observation that I had that I wanted to share. There were, uh, you know, a few talks that stood out to me. I appreciated uh, Elder Ballard's unscripted remarks. He was, you know, apologizing for his eyesight and so forth that he couldn't read a teleprompter. But like that was a, to me, far more meaningful talk and testimony than the kind of highly scripted, carefully crafted uh, talks that, that are done over the teleprompter. I would hope that the church leaders could kind of have the option to speak off the cuff versus on the teleprompter. I've, I've heard conflicting things as to whether um, people speaking in general conference have to get the, their talks kind of vetted. I know one of the benefits of doing uh, it written is that the translators can kind of have a, a translation prepared in advance to largely go off of uh, to make their job easier. That makes sense. Uh, but, you know, I, I think the pendulum can swing too far toward the direction of like the highly scripted and formulaic. So I liked Elder Ballard's. It was a refreshing... Um, it was almost like a goodbye talk, it felt like, uh, in, in a lot of ways. Um, so, yeah, lot, lots of good talks. The one that stood out that I want to talk about was Bishop Waddell, Christopher Waddell, talking about hero worship. Um, the other one that stood out to me was the one in this past session about truth, but maybe I'll save that for another day. This one about hero, hero worship was interesting because, as I've mused before, I feel like a lot of us are too quick to criticize the children of Israel for their foolish, idolatrous ways without really trying to contemplate how that applies to us, how, how we are idolatrous. I'm not going to go in deep on that. I've done other musings. If you're new here, go to sundaymusings.org, pick idolatry, you'll find them. But the point is that uh, th that we very much take the approach of, of demeaning or denigrating them unfairly or or uncharitably when we ourselves are whited sepulchers as well, uh, relying on the arm of flesh. So uh, I wanted to spend a minute talking about that because trusting in the arm of flesh is idol worship. Again, like the point was not the calf. It wasn't that it was a golden calf and it was this dumb object rather than the true and living God. Like obviously that was part of it. But, but the issue, the fundamental issue, like he talked in his talk, uh, he said that the problem wasn't the gold in the calf. The problem was what they allowed the gold to represent. It took their focus off of Jehovah as being the protector and provider of the children of Israel, as being their source of salvation. They instead were seeking mortal means, the arm of flesh, ways to attribute their protection and their prosperity to mortal means, something that they could more easily conceive of and observe and even control. That, that was the fundamental, from my perspective, that was the fundamental attribute of their idolatry. Like it could have been any animal and it could have been any form of metal, could have been no metal, could have been this invisible whatever. It was the fact that they were attributing their prosperity and their protection and seeking those things from this other source. And so here when Elder uh, Bishop Waddell was talking about that it, the problem wasn't the gold, it was what they allowed the gold to represent, hit the nail on the head. And, and our biggest problem, I, I shared before on a past musing when I taught a gospel doctrine class and we were going through the Old Testament, the lesson had to do with idolatry. And I asked the you know folks in the class, like, okay, what are the modern sources of idolatry that we in our society struggle with? And it was like a ghost town. I mean, the answers when they finally started to come were extremely basic and like, you know, cell phones and celebrities and, and some of these things that uh, aren't inherently wrong, but I think miss 
Like we're not attributing our prosperity and protection to celebrities, right? Even though they can compose this hero worship, worship that, that Bishop Waddell was talking about, right? Athletes, celebrities, politicians, scientists, influencers, musicians, podcasters, like all the, how many, how many does, do you share this experience? Uh, I, well, <laughs> should I say this or not? I, I have been in a number of uh, classes um, uh, where podcasters, I guess, and I, I'm one, so I hope none of you are like citing me in your lessons or, you know, whatever, but, but it's kind of interesting rather than the scriptures and rather than God, you know, it's like, oh, this podcaster said that. And, and that's not to say they don't have sources of truth. I'm, I'm doing this because I believe I have, you know, truth to share to the extent that I've learned it. Right. So it's not that that's bad. It's just kind of interesting to see the trend that, that uh, maybe with the explosion of podcasts and a bajillion come follow me podcasts and everything, a lot of church members, rather than going to the scriptures directly, are looking for kind of a spiritual crutch and they go to the podcaster to be the interpreter of the scriptures they're reading that week and come follow me. So I, I think that's kind of a broader, not indictment, but but um, criticism of the, the lack of sc uh, scriptural depth in a lot of church members, not all. That's not to say that someone who goes to use a podcast to supplement what they're learning has, you know, superficial uh, depth of understanding. But I, but I do think generally we as a church do have a very superficial approach to the scriptures. I mean, we remain under condemnation. Why? Because we've treated lightly the things that we've received, right? We got the Book of Mormon. It, it not only preaches about Jesus all the time, but it's a warning manual. It has all these things that we're supposed to avoid and stop and, and fight. And we've completely ignored that as a church culture. We've basically buried it. We've, we've ignored past church leaders who hammered that, that message home about all the, you know, secret combinations and so forth. And, and no wonder we remain under condemnation, as it says in the Doctrine and Covenants. So Bishop Waddell says that in our, he said, in our complex world, it can be tempting to turn to society's heroes in an effort to provide clarity to life when it may seem confusing or overwhelming. Right. This can be podcasters. It can be authors. It can be, you know, philosophers and new age gurus. And, you know, uh, if you're Tim Ballard, a, a, uh, <laughs> a seance, uh, you know, psychic that you hire to see dead Mormon prophets. It's so easy for people to turn to other sources and go down these wandering paths in hopes of obtaining this clarity um, that that Bishop Waddell is talking about. He said uh, what was once innocent childhood fun, like, you know, learning about celebrities or having a favorite athlete or some influencer or whatever, said it can become a stumbling block when hero worship of all these people causes us to look beyond the mark and lose sight of what's truly essential. Now, I want to suggest, because he didn't, that church leaders themselves could be included in that list. His list included politicians, bloggers, influencers, athletes, or musicians, and he's not wrong. I think those those are accurate, but I think it's an incomplete list. I, I would suggest that our church culture has a bit of hero worship when it comes to our own church leaders. There's that famous quote, I don't remember who said it, but you've heard it before, where some Catholic person was like, you know, the Catholics believe that their church, that, that their prophet or whatever, that, that believe that the Pope is um, is infallible, but none of the members believe that. And then he said of the Mormons that, you know, all the Mormons believe that their leader, the prophet, is fallible, but nobody actually believes that. So kind of a, a humorous observation. But I think, I, think, um, I think we've seen a lot of people kind of play hero worship with our own church leaders. And that's not to say, just like with athletes, uh, you know, that their amazing things should be praised, but confined to appropriate you know, praise or celebrities, right? Hey, you were a really good actor in that movie, but like we shouldn't hang necessarily on every word and every opinion. And just because you like this brand of fashion, suddenly I should start, you know, dressing that way too, right? Or politicians. I mean, the obvious, you know, example of stupidity there. Um, and, and, and so I think, I think we can often treat church leaders the same way that the very fact that we, um, call the president of the church the prophet 
uh, it is kind of this this status that we like like we we sustain them as prophet seers and revelators, but that does not mean that everything that is said is prophetic, and and yet our church culture conditions us to ignore that and to assume that every word that is uttered and everything that's said is prophetic. And then when a conflict comes, when questions arise, oftentimes people have a faith crisis. COVID was a great example. Here's the first presidency urging everyone to take the the thing. I don't know if YouTube is still uh, banning videos that mention the thing. But uh, for those of you watching on Facebook and listening to the podcast, I also post this over on YouTube. Um, Now, the letter comes out urging everyone to get it, saying it's safe and effective. As it turns out, it's neither. (laughs) It's neither safe nor effective. And so you have all these church members who ever since that letter came out have been deeply struggling because they were conditioned to believe that the president of the church is the prophet and and you know that no nothing on letterhead or over the pulpit could ever uh, say anything that was incorrect or that wasn't God's will they they set up for themselves a standard this very high standard or the, or they they incorporated this cultural standard that we've created for the prophet and then when the slightest kind of question arises or conflict comes, they're like, oh, wait, you know, they don't know how to handle it because they don't have the nuance. They, they don't uh, have any idea how to ascribe infallibility, unprophetic uh, statements to the prophet because the culture has conditioned them to kind of see this in a binary. So, so I, I agree with Bishop Waddell that hero worship is a problem in our society. But I, I think in our own church culture, we have a bit of it as well. Even, even you know, the, the way we stand, you know, someone enters the room or, or like the way that like when a new bishop is called and the whole family is there, all the relatives, everyone is there to, to witness, you know, uh, him being uh, called and then later set apart. Um, when, when, you know, the true doctrine is that all callings are equal and the, you know, the eyes can't say to the hand, I have no need of thee. We are all members of the body of Christ. We just got done reading that a few weeks ago and come follow me. And so that's the true doctrine that there's kind of an equality in the church where whether you're a nursery leader or the bishop, it shouldn't matter. And yet we elevate these celebrity-like, hero-like callings and, and treat them with this awe and reverence, right? Uh, oh, a general authority walked in the room. Let's all stand and be silent, you know, and, and, and have this like high level of adoration. And I'm not saying we should be jerks or unkind or, 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 or anything, but, but we've created these cultural practices that condition people into this narrative of effectively hero worship. And, and, and when the general authorities should, aren't any greater than, you know, the, the nursery leader and, and the local ward, they are just other members of the body of Christ. And yet we, we heap praise upon them and hang on their every word. And, and granted, the words that they speak that are truly from God, they are authorized servants and that is their station. But the same applies to your stake president. The same applies to your bishop. The same applies to your quorum leader. The same applies to you. Okay, so... Final thing else, I, I mentioned Tim Ballard earlier. <laughs> uh, I, I think here's another recent example where many members of the church are deeply struggling as a result of hero worship. This gentleman has has been the subject of hero worship in, in the church community because of his professional employment and all the you know uh, praise that's been lavished upon him. And, and not wrongfully so. I mean, fighting human trafficking is a worthy cause. Yet I have seen over the past few weeks so many members of the church deeply struggling with the fact that the church basically put a ton of distance between itself and him uh, with all of these new articles and revelations coming out, all these allegations coming out. And it's been a very interesting to see the reaction uh, from from some members. Uh, granted, it's it's hard to conclude precisely what is actually true when there's not a lot of evidence, and yet documents have been coming out from the prosecutorial investigation and um, and all these interviews with people closely connected to Tim, revealing all kinds of crazy stuff. And and the reaction with members of the church who have held Tim in extremely high esteem, who have basically had their own hero worship when it comes to Tim, are really struggling. 
I, I don't intend for this to be an OUR or Tim Ballard podcast. I will say I've talked to uh, three of the alleged victims uh, of sexual abuse at the hands of Tim. I talked to them one week ago. Um, I find them extremely credible. Very, very credible. I think there's a very high likelihood that they're telling the truth, uh, much of which has not yet hit the, the press, the, the degree to which this all happened. Uh, there are other developments that I'm not at liberty to talk about right now that will soon be increasingly public. If, if you're sniffing around the, the deep underbelly of Twitter and other places where there's chatter, perhaps you'll, you'll see some of this. But, um, but there's more developments on the way. And I think it's going to be very hard for a lot of these members of the church who have for years elevated this, this in particular individual to this hero like status um, and, and becoming like fanboys and fangirls. And oh my gosh, and like just creating this almost reverential, like, uh, you know, deference and, and, and treatment kind of like celebrity, you know, hero worship. So I think that's just a very hyper recent example and one that is very local to our community, uh, where this is still unfolding and still, uh, will be unfolding here soon. But, but so many of these church members have gotten very defensive. As I said in my musing a couple weeks ago about this, right? Initially it was, they were attacking vice and no, the church is wrong or the, no, excuse me. At first it was, they were attacking vice and they were saying that the church didn't actually say that because it's not on the church newsroom web. Like they were getting very defensive. And then when it was revealed that it actually did come from the church and it's like, well, the PR department went rogue or, you know, like, like always just this defensive thing because these people can't reconcile the allegations um, with the level of hero worship that they have uh, engaged in. I think it would cause uh, them uh, a bit of cognitive dissonance or, or, or if they were to truly confront the problem, they would have to realize that they are part of the problem by having treated one individual this way. You can, you can want to fight human trafficking and, and save the babies and do all the things without putting onto one person this, this celebrity-like status and basically saying he can do no wrong it is the effective uh, you know, result of that type of treatment almost. Um, where we believe everything he says, right? Like, because he's, he's been embodied as this, this hero, uh, this Superman-like figure that, that must be right. And so then when he says something that conflicts with a very credible allegation uh, against him, when he gets defensive, people are implicitly believing him because they've already created this hero-like model in their mind. So more to come. There will be other developments coming out. I just share that because I think uh, it's one thing to talk about these things in the abstract, this hero worship or like idolatry with, with the children of Israel. It's one thing to talk in the abstract or to be vague or, or to talk generally. Uh, it's another thing to give very specific, very recent examples where we can actually try and apply some of this stuff and, and improve our lives, be cautious, don't engage in hero worship, don't engage in idolatry, and, and don't elevate anyone, any mortal individual in, in the place of Christ as the provider and protector uh, for, for all of us. It's not going to come from the arm of flesh. It's not going to come from amazing uh, church leaders. Uh, it's going to come directly as a result of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, and so I think that's, that's the true north. That's what we have to be careful with is to not put anyone uh, elevating them above, above other individuals um, and, and not creating this inequality of status in our society where we elevate these people and, and shower them with praise and hang on their every word. So more to come. Brief musing. We'll wrap it there. Hope you guys had a good general conference weekend. And uh, one of one of our traditions every every general conference we have a bunch of water tanks because you know I went through a big prepper phase and uh, so we have all these water tanks. Um, and so we rotate one tank every uh, every general conference. And uh, I was filling one today, and apparently the hose fell off. Uh, and you know, for like twenty five minutes, was just running in our uh, cold storage, uh, basement room. So that was loads of fun. Uh, hopefully you guys, uh, have had a better day than I had there, but, uh, stay tuned next week. Got a fun topic for you. I hope you guys have an awesome week and talk to you soon.